Let's think big, they said. No. On the contrary, let's think small. Imagine a blueberry and a strand of our hair. The difference in scale between the width of that blueberry and the diameter of that strand of hair is the same difference in scale between the diameter of that strand of hair and the scale that I'll be talking about today. Did you know that the world's first computer, first digital computer, filled up a 30 by 50 foot room? Probably, but still, look how far we've come. Pull out the average smartphone from your pockets today, and they fit snugly into our hands, compact and convenient. In fact, your phone could very well have been fabricated with the so-called 7 nanometer process. To put that into perspective, if that 7 nanometer mobile processor was turned into a 7 centimeter diameter baseball, which is about the average size of a baseball, the average 171 centimeter male would become a giant with a height of almost three times the radius of the Earth. Not to mention, today's smartphone's capabilities far surpass those of the world's first computer. So, the million-dollar question. How on earth did we go from the world's first computer that spanned an entire basement to today's handheld smartphone that still outperforms its ancestor? In other words, how did we manage to get these computers so dang small while still stuffing even more functions into it than the world's first computer ever had? A partial answer to this question involves photolithography. But what is photolithography? Well, I'll start with a simple explanation of lithography, one of the ancestors of photolithography, if you will. Lithography is an older process, invented in 1796. And it was a process that takes advantage, it is a process that takes advantage of the fact that oil and water don't mix very well. And it was a process that was originally intended for the reproduction of sheet music, so that one could write down their sheet music once and then be able to copy and reproduce it. First, one would draw their desired design or write their desired writing onto a lithographic grainy stone slab. Then, by covering the stone slab with solutions, such as a solution of gum arabic and nitric acid and other solutions, we can selectively kind of recreate images with lithography, especially like when you place paper onto the stone slab. When you kind of press down the paper onto the stone slab, you can copy all of the original design's minute details. Because at that point, lithography is a process that can selectively recreate images onto a different mediums indefinitely. And it turns out that photolithography is rather similar to lithography even if it doesn't involve kind of uh, oil and water as its main materials. The key difference between the two processes lies in photolithography's prefix, photo, which means light. And this new involvement of light is rather analogous to the solution of gum arabic and nitric acid used in lithography. And so photolithography invent was invented in 1952 by Jay Lathrop and James Nall at the predecessor of today's Army Research Laboratory. It was a solution as to how they could better fit the necessary circuits in the limited space available inside a proximity fuse. And so photolithography is a process that involves the selective opening or closing of the surface of a semiconductor, typically silicon. And this is quite similar to how we can recreate, selectively recreate images using lithography. Imagine cutting cake, and instead of cutting it into eight uniform slices, like doing, going with the conventional route, say you want to cut a square right from the middle of the cake. You'd probably trace and cut the outline first, and then carefully remove it, leaving a square-shaped hole in the middle of the cake. This is essentially how photolithography works. But, however, because it is very difficult for us to try and cut a square out from a piece of silicon wafer, we leave it up to something called a mask to be your knife, and UV light or ultraviolet light to be the mouth that ravenously consumes the square piece of cake. But you might ask, what is a mask? Well, a mask is something 
that contains your design in the form of negative space, meaning that if you shine a flashlight through this mask onto a wall, you'll get the opposite of a shadow puppet or a light puppet, and that would be your design. And so instead of the wafer slowly being eaten away by the UV light exposure, the mask helps protect all areas that you want to keep, and the UV light would only be able to pass through the negative space in the mask. And so essentially, the mask helps block light where you don't want it to go. Alternatively, treat the silicon wafer like the entire cake. Say you wanted to eat the entire cake, but your mother says absolutely not and restricts you, limits you, so you can only eat the square piece of cake in the middle. In that case, your mother is what we would call the mask in photolithography. And you would be the mouth that ravenously consumes the square piece of cake. And with this actually comes a crucial step of the process, a crucial material called photoresist, which is something that we spread in a uniform layer onto the silicon wafer. And, this, and it kind of acts as an intermediate between the silicon wafer and the UV light. And so there are two kinds of photoresist, one being positive and the other being negative. But we'll stick with positive. The positive photoresist helps carve your design in the form of negative space, which is exactly like how you carve the square piece of cake from the entire cake. Another way of describing this phenomenon is to say that positive photoresist melts away or clears wherever it is exposed to UV light. And of course, I am oversimplifying this process quite a bit, but it's often valuable to see the general picture before being bombarded by specific details. So the general four-step process of photolithography that you should at least try to take away from today is as follows. One, surface treatment, where you treat the wafer to a multitude of materials that drive out water in order to encourage adhesion between the silicon wafer and the photoresist. Because photoresist is actually an organic material that does not like sticking to water. And so you'll also probably heat the silicon wafer on a hot plate at about 100 degrees Celsius or so to dehydrate it even further. Two, spin coating. We use spin coat photoresist onto the wafer using a device called a spin coater, which actually takes advantage of centrifugal force, which is, but in reality, inertia, to spread a uniform layer, a uniform coating of photoresist onto the silicon wafer. Three, exposure, which involves UV light to melt away certain areas of photoresist so that you can etch the silicon wafer later. Because in reality, photolithography doesn't actually etch or kind of eat away at the wafer itself. Instead, it does that with the photoresist. And so photolithography actually prepares the silicon wafer for a process called etching that actually cuts away equal thickness of the photoresist and the silicon wafer to create the actual indent in the silicon wafer. You'll also probably want a long pass filter uh, on the mask to avoid the T-topping, which is a phenomenon where a T-shape forms due to, due to the diffraction and reflection of the UV light, causing too much photoresist to clear out. Four, development, where you uh, clean the wafer uh, by drenching it in various solutions to develop and clean it, washing away any excess photoresist. And actually, this step involves a post-exposure ba bake on the hot plate to, watch, to avoid stress cracks due to sudden changes in temperature. And so congratulations. All of this was to create your very own master, the equivalent of lithography's stone slab, a mold or template that contains your circuit design. And so your silicon wafer can now transfer that design, reproduce it, just like lith how lithography reproduces your grease drawing. So why photolithography? What's the point of all these silicon wafers? Well, first off, photolithography is much, much more efficient at producing circuits than trying to manually tweezer resistors onto breadboards. And plus, photolithography lets us create smaller and smaller devices, chips, more specifically, that almost impossibly fit even more complexity, practicality, and functionality into, onto their tiny, compact surfaces. And so this is especially helpful for creating devices called MEMS devices, or microelectromechanical systems, uh, such as microsensors, microactuators, microelectronics, and microstructures, 
which are small enough for us to small, uh, squeeze and stack into tinier and tinier spaces. It's what allows Apple to keep trying to make their phones thinner every year. How about Lab on a Chip, an example of a MEMS device? Lab on a Chip takes advantage of certain fluids, it's exactly as its name suggests. It's a system that involves multiple laboratory techniques uh, onto a small chip, only about a few square centimeters or so in size. And so how does Lab on a Chip take advantage of these different properties of these certain fluids? Well, water at a microscale is actually acts the same as honey, ketchup, and blood does at a macro scale, which is the scale that we're all used to living in, in our daily lives. Um, and water, at a macro scale, actually acts as a Newtonian fluid, meaning that its viscosity is not affected by stress, and viscosity being how easily a fluid can flow. However, ketchup, honey, and blood are all examples of non-Newtonian fluids, meaning that its viscosities are affected by stress. And you can see this when you squeeze ketchup out of a plastic ketchup bottle, how it comes out in a steady stream, and it almost acts uh, like water, becoming more runnier, until it kind of starts sputtering, of course. And water at a microscale actually acts just like a non-Newtonian fluid, meaning that its viscosity is affected by stress. And so we can mix water using a different technique than we usually do. We can mix water with a process called diffusion, where water kind of moves from areas of higher concentration to areas of lower concentration, sort of like how the carbon dioxide we breathe out diffuses into the air. And we can mix by diffusion instead of uh, how we usually mix it in a process called turbulence, uh, such as how we vigorously stir instant hot chocolate powder into hot water to create hot chocolate. Photolithography actually has many other applications as well. Two photon lithography can create 3D shapes and a micro, sometimes even nano scale. And so you can see this because it literally almost lets us create an entire new dimension of design. And this is actually a miniature Statue of Liberty um, re being recreated using two photon lithography. And you can see the two photons here, right here. And photolithography can also let us create proper biomimetic designs, such as materials that mimic gecko setae, or the little bristles that let lizards run up trees and walls. But what about further into the future? What potential does this relatively new technique have in our ever-changing world? Well, it's worth noting that photolithography stands at the root of most nanotechnology. It's what allows us to explore new ideas as our capability to create smaller and smaller devices increases. Potential ideas still being explored include nano artery robots that can clean clogged arteries and inject medicinal drugs straight into our bloodstream, skipping the process of external injections. Or how about nano insulin pumps that can be inserted into people di diagnosed with diabetes and internally inject insulin, avoiding the current hassle of external insulin pumps that are still unwieldy devices that you attach on your belt. It's a world of endless possibility, given enough time, patience, and research. Let's take a look at BCIs. Well, what in the world are BCIs? A BCI is an acronym for brain-computer interface. And as the name suggests, it's an interface that connects a brain and a computer. They represent technologies designed to communicate with the central nervous system, such as the brain, the spinal cord, and neural sensory retina. Depending on the design and intent of this technology, we can record and interpret neural signals designed uh, to complete an internal neural action externally, perhaps on a computer. And so, if a patient has a disease or trauma that inhibits their neural functions, we can use a BCI to assist their brains and stimulate neural activity. Combined with AI and machine learning to other growing fields, photolithography can be used to create smaller and smaller BCIs, which can potentially significantly augment their capabilities. And we would be able to use this technology for generations to come. The point of this talk today was to introduce you all to one of the fundamental processes driving the development of nanotechnology. One of the obstacles facing this field, however, is the looming end to Moore's law, which stated that every two, year, two years or so, 
we would be able to double the number of transistors on integrated circuits. Such shrinking in size not only led to faster operation speed, but also lower energy consumption of, and, of course, higher device density, which are all vanishing as Moore's law is slowing down. The reason is that such shrinking is reaching its physical limit. The amount of heat that the chips generate doesn't decrease by the same proportions as we scale these chips down. And it has become impossible for us to try and cool them down fast enough to gain the processing payoff that we hope to see. Such shrinking in size, the shrinking a device even further, doesn't result in lower energy consumption either. And the number of defects are increasing as we continually try to produce smaller and smaller devices using our current technology. To those of you still undecided on your career paths, maybe you can use this information as a starting point. Because as we graduate high school and enter college and beyond, we'll be the ones in the labs and classrooms looking for a way to overcome this hurdle. We'll be the ones looking, forging solutions that will allow us to better the world, even if the difference is microscopic. We'll be the ones exploring the bounds of nanotechnology, leveraging processes like photolithography, adventuring into worlds of ever-decreasing scale. Thank you.